they see some pressure coming. So today we're going to be talking about Therese of Lisieux, um, who is another doctor of the church. Again, not doctor like medicine doctor, PhD, fancy, but somebody whose writings, especially her story of her soul, the art of her autobiography is really treasured in our church. Really, really treasured. Um, but before we get started, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the gift of Therese and how she loved your son, Jesus, and how she was devoted to his holy face. We pray for her intercession as we dive into her and who she is in her little way. We pray for all of those who are missionaries, um, who are florists, who are Carmelites, or, or have a Carmelite spirituality. May they be blessed and led closer to you through her example. And may we be inspired this Lent to grow closer to your son as we near Passion Tide. And we ask all this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. So I mentioned a little bit about um, how she's a little flower. We'll go into that a little bit. And we actually have pictures of her. So this is a legit picture of her, and there's going to be other pictures of her throughout this presentation. Um, so this is actually what she looked like. This is this is her in her Carmelite, um, Carmelite habit. And she's the patron saint of missions and florists. Um, she has the, the little flower, and she has an novena with roses. So oftentimes she gives little roses to people if they pray the novena or just ask for intercession as a little gift and saying, like, hey, I'm praying for you. Like, you got it. And she's the patron saint of the missions, even though she never left the convent, which is interesting. She had an impact on the world and on the culture, even though she never left the convent. So that's why she's the patron saint of missions. She always wanted to leave the convent. She always wanted to be able to have different roles in the church, but she loved being a Carmelite nun. And she felt called to stay there, even if she also felt this call to go out. So she was able to go out spiritually um, in the convent through all of her letters and praying for everybody. So that's why she's the patron saint of the missions. So she was born Marie-Francois Therese Martin in January in 1873 in France. These are her parents, Louis and Zelie. They're saints, which is super cool. Um, this is her as a little girl. And she's the youngest of nine kids, five of whom who survived, um, only five daughters. So she's um, blessed, blessed her dad, um, blessed the one woman. Um, her older, she when she was born, her, her sister Marie was 12. Her sister Pauline was 11. And then you have Mimi and Celine. Um, her sisters Marie and Pauline, especially Pauline, were like second moms to her, as we're going to see, like second moms. Zelie made lace and Louis made watches. So blue collar people. And they loved the Lord. Uh, they raised their kids like really authentically Catholic. They had a domestic church. Um, and they just appreciated everything and really imbued the faith in their life. Therese was blonde, blue-eyed, affectionate, stubborn, lively, um, mischievous, and self-confident. Um, some would later call her even like a brat because she was very spoiled. Um, and she was her father's little queen. She loved her dad. She loved her dad. Um, they had a great relationship. Uh, she had a great relationship with her mom, too, but she was her dad's little queen. Of all, the, of all the daughters, he definitely had a favorite, and it was Therese. Well, at four years old, her mom died of breast cancer. Uh, so she lost her, um, uh, and this was her at age eight, and her sister Pauline. Um, and yeah, like that was really hard on her. It was very, very difficult. Um, losing a parent um, at any age is hard, but especially when she was four. Uh, she was like just becoming like getting into her, her own skin and like understanding who she is. And then her mom dies. Uh, but she had daily walks with her papa and um, her older sisters taught her and stepped into that mother figure for her. Um, and eventually she would go to Catholic school, um, but she hated it. She was very much a homebody. And so she wanted to be taught by her sister. She didn't want to be at this school um, she often had tantrums um, even before her mother passed away. Um, 
all her life, all her life, especially in her childhood, like God's love was very tangible to her. Very, very tangible. Um, she had a great family life. Um, lots of uh, physical acts of love. Um, she was very, she was much uh, like the five, five, one, but five love languages. She loved physical touch and she loved um, just hugging her, hugging her parents and hugging her um, sisters. Yeah. So her mom actually wrote, we have, we have records of what she was like as a kid. I said she was stubborn. That was totally true. She flew into tantrums all the time. Um, when something didn't go her way, she, had a fit. Um, she was a typical kid. She was a typical child, uh, rolling on the floor in desperation, like without any hope. Um, and she was very nervous, but she was also very smart, uh, very curious. Um, and she remembered everything, remembered everything, even the littlest of things. And her nurse, Victoria, she was the one who was <laughs> that. So she, she had this kind of attitude about her, this very self-assured, self-confident. In one way, it could be taken as like, oh, you're just a spoiled brat kid. But also, she was very just confident in who she was, in her identity, as a beloved daughter of the Lord, and a beloved daughter of Zoe and Louis. After her mother died, her happy disposition completely changed. She was a happy-go-lucky kid, always smiling, always having a good time. And then she just became timid, shy, quiet, and didn't talk much. As you can imagine, that would affect the child that's expected how it would affect. Um, and she was very, very sensitive. She became um, like hypersensitive at times. And some psychologists and counselors even look back on her writings and they could possibly even diagnose her with a mental disorder because of that trauma that she experienced, um, starting with her mom's death and later her father's death as well. But they visit different churches. So on those walks with her dad, you'd go all over Le Sou. Um, which is a gorgeous town in France. Um, and you can, have, you can have virtual tours on YouTube um, that show a little bit of Lasso. It's just beautiful. It's gorgeous. Um, so she would go on those walks and have a good time with her dad, even after her mom passed away, even after that happened. So she spent five years in that Catholic school, as I said, um, and it was the worst parts of her life. She wanted to be back home because she treasured that time with her sisters. Even when she was this young, she knew that her sister Pauline wanted to enter the Carmelite Monastery in Lazio. She knew that. And so she knew that Pauline was going to leave. That she wanted to soak up as much time with her as possible. Um, and eventually, when um, Therese was nine, her sister did enter um, the monastery. And later, her another sister would, and then she would enter herself. But she struggled with scrupulosity. Um, she, she was depressed and very hypersensitive as I said. So some would even diagnose her with depression. And the scrupulosity was theologically a thing of the day that people got carried away and were focused, so focused on um, examining their sins and nitpicking themselves to the point of missing God's mercy. She didn't miss God's mercy. She was um, a vessel of God's mercy um, and really accepted and came to appreciate um, what that really meant for her, um, as we'll see in her little way. And there was a story with um, Our Lady of the Smile. I'll get into this. So this is the statue that is in their home, in the Martin home in Lazoo. Um, and St. Luke, her dad had been given this statue by a friend, and he placed this statue in their family garden. And then when he, when he and Zelly got married, they got a home, and then he moved it into the house and gave it this place of honor. And this happened to be in Therese's bedroom. So she saw this statue every single day before she went to bed and as she woke up, she saw this statue. And the girls loved it statue. They would decorate it with flowers from the garden. Um, and their dad said that they'd possibly wear it out from kissing it so much. They'd kiss Mary on the cheeks. Uh, yeah, and kiss her on the feet. And so during the winter after her sister Pauline entered Carmel, so remember, Therese is like nine years old at this point, Therese fell seriously ill. Later in the story of the show, she would blame it on the devil, how she just was like plagued by the serious sickness. Whatever it was, doctors couldn't diagnose it. They didn't know what it was. And it was during this time that 
you know, she had headaches, insomnia, fever, and she would look to this statue um, to pray for Our Lady's intercession for some some someone's of comfort. Her sister Marie thought she was dying, and for all intents and purposes, if the doctors didn't know it was wrong, she could have been dying, and you wouldn't know any different. So at one point on May 13th, which would later become the feast of Marie of Fatima, I believe, May 13th, um, she looked to this statue, fell, fell on her knees, and her sister Marie actually did, and he, be he begged um, our Lord for a cure through the intercession of Mary. Um, and Therese was in her bed, like just sick as can be, and her sisters were there before the statue, um, and they joined their sister in prayer. And then all of a sudden, Marie looked from the statue over to Therese, and Therese was not looking at the statue. She was fixed on like a different part of the room, just like an open part of the room. And she was like locked in and focused. She wasn't looking at them. She wasn't looking at the statue. She had a vision of Lee. And in this vision, uh, it was, she had this tremendous beauty, tremendous beauty. And she had this great smile on her face. Um, and it was this smile that was to her like a ray of sunshine. It not, not only brightened her day, but afterward, she was fine. It cured her. So it was this smile and this joy. And she was transfixed for about like five minutes or so. And then she just kind of came back. At, she had two tears come down from her eyes. And she would say, why, why did you cry? I was like, I cried because our Mary left me. She disappeared. And then that's when all the symptoms just went away. So till this day, the statue is in Therese's room and what was Therese's room. And it's known as Our Lady of the Smile. So for that, for that cure. Yeah. And at age 12, there was um, a fun story where um, her one of her sisters had no use for this doll making kit. Therese loved dolls, loved dolls. Um, so it had like yarn, it had... Um, new stuff for new dresses it had um like all the yarn materials and even like little laces that her mom had that were stored um and her sister was like pick what you want and she's like i choose everything i choose all she took the whole basket which fits threads so so well i choose all it fits her she never did anything halfway that was that she, she always gave her all 110 percent and yeah she was spoiled that's true that was that's yeah but she was very very loved she was very very loved here is the prayer that therese wrote to our lady of the smile so i'll say it i'm just gonna give some time to reflect on it oh mary mother of jesus and our gentle mother too with a visible and radiant smile, you consoled and cured your beloved child, Therese of the child Jesus. We ask you now to smile on us in the troubles of our lives. May your gentle smile bring light and healing to the darkness and disease of our body, mind, and spirit. Instill us with hope and deepen our faith so that we enjoy forever a maternal and rapturing smile. Any reflections on that prayer? Anything that stands out to you? Beautiful. Smile on us amid the troubles of our lives. Right? Because we all have troubles. Anything else stick out? I think it's interesting how <clears throat> she wants the darkness, wants me your gentle smile to bring light and healing to the darkness and disease of our body, which somehow you think she would stop there, but she remembered to put in mind and spirit. Yep. Yeah. Instill us with hope. 
So a little like Mary Intermission. Yeah, he wants us to enjoy heaven. He doesn't want us like be bored in heaven. Um, yeah, there's the um, culture reference here. Anybody ever see The Simpsons? Okay. I'm not much of a fan, but I know the one scene, they have like different heavens. And then there's um, some heavens that are like everybody's dull and boring. And then there's the Catholic heaven. Everybody's having a party. <laughs> that's 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 what that's what got a lot. It's a party. All heaven is a party. So yeah, he, he wants to enjoy. Uh, that's a yeah, yeah, little side thing. Yeah. So here's the story. So in addition to the one of I choose all, here's the other really popular story of Saint Sarez. It's called the Christmas Conversion. And this is the fireplace in in the Martin household in Lazoo. You can visit this. People go all the time. Um, this happened when she was 13 in front of this fireplace. So I'm going to tell it as she told it. She wrote about it. So I'm going to I'm going to write I'm going to read her words. When we got home from midnight mass, I knew that I should find my shoes standing at the fireplace filled with presents as I had always done since I was little. So you can see I was still treated as a baby. Father used to love to see how happy I was, hear my cries of delight, as I took each surprise packet from my magic shoes, and his pleasure made me happier still. The time had come for Jesus to cure me of my childishness. Even the innocent joys of childhood would go. He allowed Father to feel this cross this year. Instead of spoiling me, and as I was going upstairs, I heard him saying to one of my sisters, Therese ought to have outgrown all this sort of thing, and I hope this will be the last time. This cut me to the quick, and Celine, who knew how very sensitive I was, whispered, don't come again down just yet. you only go and cry if you open your presence now in front of the Father. But I was not the same Therese anymore. Jesus had changed me completely. I held back my tears, trying to stop my heart from beating so fast, and then I ran down into the dining room. I picked up the shoes and unwrapped my presents joyfully, looking all the while as happy as a queen. Father did not look frustrated anymore now, and he entered into the fun of it, while Celine thought she must have been dreaming, but this was no dream. I had gotten back forever the strength of mind that I lost at four and a half. So she would call this the Christmas miracle, this turning point of she just had this prayer experience where she set aside her childishness and set aside this like part of her that was stuck in the past to embrace this new season, this new sense of maturity. And again, there's a difference between childishness and childlikeness. She set aside her childishness, but her childlikeness stayed. It stayed even into the combat. But she set aside this because the Lord was calling her deeper. It deepened her relationship with the Lord, and she would call this like an act of grace that flooded her soul. This happened. She was open, and it gave her the strength to do what she knew was important in that moment. Yeah. And she understood um, what she must do to love God more intimately. And it left her um, against those, or to set aside those childish ways of like relating to God and keeping those childlike ways of relating to God. Okay. Eventually, as we know, her sister did enter Carmel, um, a Carmel convent, and she felt called by God to also enter, even at just 15. So she was actually barely 15 when she approached the Carmelite directors, the nuns of the convent, to enter. And they said, no, you're, you're, you're too young. What are you doing? No. Like, wait a little bit. Wait till you're 21. See what happens. Like, like, like some boys and figure it out. Like, but she, she had this deep, 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 deep desire. 
They said, oh, well, I mean, you can go see the bishop. I was only, I'm only his delegate. You could, you, of course. And she was like, bet, invitation accepted, challenge accepted. I'm going to go see the bishop. Bishop said the same thing. Like, just wait. You're too young. Relax a little bit. Um, and the bishop actually never forgot who she was. She made such an impression on him when she visited him, asking and this passionate desire to enter Carmel that he would remember her until, last, until his last day. He wrote about her and saying, like, this girl made such a deep impression on me. And it was a surprising request. Never had anybody ever asked him of that, let alone a 15-year-old girl. She was so passionate about her relationship with the Lord, and she knew she wanted to, she was called to enter Carmel. She just didn't want to just follow her sisters there. It wasn't about that. It was about this deeper call to have this intimate relationship with the Lord. And she felt called to have that relationship in the context of a religious vocation. Okay. So, and she actually, on her meeting with the bishop, she put up her hair, just like in this picture. She wanted to look older. Because she knew that, man, if my hair is down, I'm going to be called called out, and they're just not going to accept me. So she put up her hair, wanting to look older. And she said she wished it. She wished it since the dawn of reason. She wished it. And her father was support, supportive of it. Her father gave her, gave, was all into it. He said, of course. And imagine that. Most of his daughters would enter Carmel. So his wife died. His, his daughters, most of his daughters are leaving him. That's quite a sacrifice for a dad. Quite a sacrifice. He's never going to see his daughters again, or maybe once a year, if that. And he loved them dearly. Imagine if your kids and your grandkids, you couldn't see them. They decided to go off to a convent or go off to a monastery, and you couldn't see them ever again. That's that kind of anguish that Louis was experiencing. But he, he gave that to God. He said, you're going to take care of them. You're going to take care of them. I know you will. So that's one of the reasons why, like, he and his wife were saints, because they gave their kids over to God. They didn't grasp on that control. Eventually, when she met with the bishop, he said, like, no, but she was so persistent. Uh, so who did she go to next? She went to Pope Leo XIII. <laughs> That's the veracity of this little girl. So he was celebrating his golden jubilee as a priest. So golden jubilee is like when you've been a priest or a religious for 50 years. So every single year, there was a mass, and that's hosted at the seminary, where all of these sisters come together and they celebrate their golden jubilee. And they go like 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, and even some that are 60 and 70 years um, nowadays. So Pope Leo was celebrating his 50th um, year of being a priest. And he had this huge celebration in Rome for that. And the family went to Rome to go see him. And she thought, perfect opportunity. <laughs> and what did she do? She went right up to him uh, against everybody else's wishes. Um, so they had a Sunday audience, and um, they were forbidden to speak. They, nobody wanted all, all of the people around Pope Leo the Thirteenth didn't want anybody around. He wasn't accepting guests. He wasn't accepting visitors. He just wanted to speak. <laughs> and go. But Therese, again, determined. She said, I'm just going to go right up to him. So that's what she did. She went right up to him. And she said, this is, this is the, her account of it. Most Holy Father, I have a favor to ask of you. <laughs> Holy Father, in honor of your jubilee, permit, permit me to enter Carmel at the age of 15. Pope replied, well, my child, do what the Spirit will sell you. She rested her hand, she touched the Pope, resting her, her hands on his knees. Oh, Holy Father, if you say yes, everybody will agree. And then he stressed each syllable, go, go. You will enter if God wills it. She would enter soon after. She had the guts to talk to the Pope. 
And he basically said yes. <laughs> so she took that as a okay. And shortly after, she did it anyway. Shortly after. Um, yeah. So that happened in, I think that was November and later April. She would, or in the winter. And then later after 2015. Meanwhile, her father's health was declining. So he had plaque buildup in his arteries that increased the amount of blood flow to his brain. So one of um, her sisters, Celine, stayed home to care for him. Uh, and he was just declining and declining and declining. So her dad was able to attend her habit ceremonies when she entered Carmel and was given that habit in the beginning. And this is actually like the beginner's habit at Carmel with the white. So he was there, but um, in February um, of the next year, he had this bout of dementia and then actually got lost for three days. He just like left home and got lost. Um, and he turned up in a nearby town. And then in August of that same year, he became paralyzed. So it just like got worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and she's in Carmel at this point. So it was her sister. One of her sisters was caring for her, caring for him at home. And again, Zelly's, Zelly's passed away long at this point. So their dad is getting um, sicker and sicker. And then he made one last visit to Carmel in May of 1892. And this one last visit, she would treasure for the rest of her life. And she took the name at, at the convent, Therese of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face. And this is the picture of um, like kind of both ch the Child Jesus and the Holy Face. So she writes more about why she chose those names why she shows that part of her religious name. Um, child Jesus, because of that childlikeness. She had that deep, deep in her. That was part of her, part of her story and part of how she related to the Lord. And on the holy face, she resonated with St. Veronica. So that makes his names. So eventually, when her dad did pass away, so that was 1892, her sister Celine would enter Carmel afterward. So Polly, Celine, Therese, three of the five. Um, and they were all, um, they all did basic kind of daily chores and manual labor at Carmel. So Therese got the dot job because she was the youngest. Um, she washed, she mopped, and she dusted all the time. And there are stories of her and a sister, Sister Pierre, who was the cranky old nun. Uh, Pierre did not like her, hated her, um, treated her very badly. Uh, think of the stereotypical um, school teacher Catholic nun. That was Sister Pierre, except she wasn't a teacher. She was that cranky, that pestering, and just didn't like to rest. Uh, there are, there's a movie rendition where you can see sister, like see an actress like be Sister Pierre, and it brings her to life in a way that like it's like Therese is just being a trooper. So Therese didn't like fight back or push back at Sister Pierre. She respected her elder, and she accepted this these um, moments of when Sister Pierre was just like calling on her to do more chores and like, oh, like dust again, you didn't do a good job. Like she took these and accepted them with humility. Didn't complain, did, her, did what she was called to do very, very willingly. And she had difficulty with the rosary. There was time and time where she would just fall asleep in the chat. So if you've fallen asleep in the church before or during holy hour, you're in good company with St. Therese. I have before, so. Uh, yeah, and it was difficult for her. Remember, she struggled with scrupulosity. It was difficult for her to not fall into discouragement. She compared herself to like Sister Pauline and the others. She compared herself to her sisters and bigger saints than her. And this led her to be dependent on the Lord, which was in a way, this spark of her little way. 
They said they they're just they're already up there. Think of like a like a ladder kind of analogy, um, which comes from Therese. Like all these big saints, they're already up there. They're having they're having a good time. They're there already. But I'm on the way down here. I'm too small, too little to get to get there. So what she what she what would she do? She literally went like this and said, like, good father, like lift me up. And then in her little mischievous nature, it's like, I get higher than you because he lifts me up higher than you. So she, the father would lift her up and then she'd be like, hi, all these big saints that she like honored, she'd be like, looking down at them because the father lifted her up. Like kind of like divine elevator, so to speak. That, that's her little way. Of being little, that desire to be humble and practice humility and be childlike. Not childish, childlike. And the more that she embraced that childlike joy and her relationship with the Lord as like a child, that was her little way. And there is there are depths to kind of go into with her little way that are so, so, so beautiful. Um, there was this story where she was praying and she was like wondering, like, okay, what is my what is my call in Carmel? What is my mission? And she had this like epiphany. And that's where we get the her line, my vocation is love. She's like, I'm not called to be a missionary. I'm not called to do this or that. I can't be like this sister. I can't be like my sister Pauline. My vocation is love. It was this epiphany God moment for her where she discovered what the heart of the gospel is. It's love. All of our vocations are love in each of our own ways. And that was her call too. And she embraced that um, so, so, so willingly and so openly. Right. When she turned 23, there was first evidence of her um, suffering from tuberculosis. So was, at that point she was confined to the infirmary, confined to a bed similar to her mom, confined to a bed. And it was then that she wrote and dictated Story of a Soul. So she had journals and letters that she wrote, and those are in Story of a Soul. But then also she dictated um, a lot of what is in Story of a Soul as well. That's her um, spiritual autobiography. And from fact, the statue of Our Lady of Smile joined her in the infirmary as well. Like somebody brought it to her. Um, Oh, many of her sisters, like her fellow sisters, thought she was unremarkable. She didn't stand out. She was normal. She was the youngest sister in the convent. They thought nothing of her. Sister um, Pierre didn't like her. Sister Pierre wasn't the only sister who didn't like her. They had no idea they had a saint in their midst. They had no idea. They would have never guessed. And as they were, as they were, as she was dying, they were preparing her obituary, and they were wondering what they were going to write about her, because she hadn't done anything of note. That's how they thought about her. Of course, her biological sisters were like, "She's amazing. Um, she was a brat, but she's nice. She's she's holy." But they didn't think she'd be a saint. They didn't think she'd be that kind of powerhouse of um, that she has become. And she actually heard that. She heard that she hadn't done anything of note right outside her window in the infirmary. So she heard these sisters talk about her that way. Another hit to the ego, but she didn't take that as a way she would when she was a kid. She took that with art of humility and said, Lord, like, like, I know I'm of note to you. I know I'm important to you. In the last nine months of her life, she experienced a dark night, which if you've heard me talk about the dark night before, it's this deep experience of desolation and sorrow and sadness where you don't feel the presence of God. Mother Teresa had this for, I think, about 40, if not more years of her life when she was doing all she did in Calcutta, didn't feel the presence of God. Would pray, have a daily holy hour in the morning before she'd set out with all the other sisters, 
didn't feel a thing. We've got a mask, receive Eucharist, didn't feel a thing. Perez had this for the last nine months of her life. Which on top of tuberculosis, that's a cross. That's a cross. But to her, and to many other saints who experience the dark night, that kind of suffering is an invitation to the cross. It's a kiss of Jesus, how some saints describe it. It's him bringing them closer in intimacy. So rather than like interpreting it as a punishment, which it is not, it's a gift of grace from the Lord and saying like, you're ready to go deeper. You're ready to come close. So close, you're united with me on the cross. So she experienced that. And then after she passed away, within months, the monastery started getting all of these letters, all of these reports of graces attributed to her intercession. People knew who she was inside the convent. She wasn't as popular as other saints were. Like we talked about Catherine of Siena. She wasn't as popular as Catherine of Siena, but like at the time of her, um, when she was alive, but people knew who she was. But for more, she was basically nobody, but they knew she was holy. So they prayed for her intercession, and they were receiving all of these reports. All of these reports. And eventually it came to note that she was something of note, because all of these reports were coming in. Something was different about her that they didn't recognize. So eventually, so many years later, Story of a Soul was published. They began to get all these reports and saying like, okay, this is important. This is serious. This girl is a saint. And she died at 24. And eventually, after the story of the soul was published, it got more and more momentum, more and more popularity. She was canonized in 1925. And in 97, she was declared a doctor of the church. John Paul II called her the youngest of the doctors of the church, which is true. But her ardent spiritual journey shows much maturity, much maturity. And the insights of faith expressed in her writings are so vast and profound that they deserve a place among the great spiritual masters. So while some quickly dismiss her as a brat and miss the entire point of what she's writing about in the story of the soul, the church says, there's something here that we have to recognize. And something beautiful about her little way that we can all emulate. A way of spiritual childhood, of trust, of saying, Lord, I can't do this on my own, lift me up. And this surrender. Her feast day is October 1st, which is, I think, the day before um, the Feast of the Archangels. Yeah. yeah, that week of October is like stacked with saints. And she's the first one on that week. And she would write in our story of a soul, as she's dying from tuberculosis, after my death, I will let fall a shower of roses. I will spend my heaven doing good upon earth. I will raise up a mighty host of little saints. My mission is to make God loved. Oh, I've known people that have like prayed the novena and gotten roses before, uh, even in the littlest of ways. So she keeps her promises with uh, that shower of roses. So, yeah. All right. So we have Our Lady of the Smile. Here are some other Therese titles of Mary that she loved. Mother of the Little Ones. She herself was a little one. She loved Our Lady of Sorrows, especially when her mom passed away. She embraced that uh, time of sorrow and that grief. And she would go to Our Lady to help with her, help that, and also when her father passed away. So she lost both of her parents by in her 20s. She lost her mother when she was four and lost her dad in her 20s. So by the time she passed away, 
her parents were gone. She had a couple sisters in karma with her. So it was very, very hard for her. So she called Therese, or she called Mary, more a mother than a queen. Which, yes, she is the queen of the saints and the queen of heaven. But more than a mother than a queen. So, because you can think of a queen as like somebody who's like high and holy, doesn't want to be touched. You know, but a mother is like, you're there in the trenches. You're playing with your kids. You're playing with your grandkids. Like, you have that motherly maternal care. And this is a prayer that um, Therese wrote. Oh, Virgin Mary, change my heart into a beautiful, pure corporal. Receive that white host in which our sweet lamb hides himself. And then she also talked about how Mary accompanies us to the altar. That we don't just go with like us together or with the communion of saints, even those after us. But we go with Mary to the altar too. To ask something of a blessed virgin is not the same as to ask something of God. She knows well what to do with all my little desires, and it's for her to decide whether to ask for them or not. So she entrusts her prayers and earnest actions to Mary. It says, like, you know what fits my heart the most as my mom. And I want you to bring whatever you want up to Jesus. There's an analogy that I often use for Marian intercession of we give we give Mary like an apple on a plate. Could be a little rotten, could be a little like um, dots and not the best apple at the supermarket. And Mary takes it. She says, all right, I'm going to cover this in gold. And I'm going to give it to Jesus. So she like purifies our intentions. Even if we don't know what we want as our spiritual mother, and she can bring what we truly need up to Jesus, even if we don't think we know what we need. So that's a way that Therese also saw Mary. And here's a one last prayer that Therese wrote to Mary herself. This is a long one. So the same thing we did with Our Lady to Smile. Let's reflect on this one. Virgin full of grace. I know at Nazareth you lived modestly without requesting anything more. Neither ecstasies nor miracles nor any nor other extraordinary deeds enhanced your life, O queen of the elect. The number of the lowly, the little ones, is very great on earth. They can raise their eyes to you without any fear. You are the incomparable mother who walks with them along a common way to guide them to heaven. Beloved mother, in this harsh exile, I want to live always with you and follow you every day. I am enraptured by the contemplation of you, and I discover the depths of the love of your heart. All my fears vanish under your motherly gaze, which teaches me to weep and to rejoice. Amen. Let that sink in, and we'll have some time for any reflections on this part and anything else of, of uh, what Therese thought and said and wrote about Mary. So any reflections on this prayer or anything that of Therese and Mary. Yeah, I'm a little confused about the process of canonization. Uh, clearly, she had a great relationship with Mary, and was a very holy person. But I always thought that to be canonized, you had to be a, uh, evidence of miracles. <laughs> Were there evidence of miracles with her? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as the reports were coming in, um, they became so frequent that they got sent up to the Vatican and they began that process to substantiate some of them. 
and to see like, okay, like, let's see if we can prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt. Science is, you know, like this is truly a miracle. So that's ended up happening. That they're able to prove some of these intercessions. And eventually too, or like the sisters in the convent came around and said like, wow, like we really have to have softer hearts about this girl because they were, some of them, not all of them, were mean to her and didn't treat her well, like Sister Pierre. So they also helped her cause as well. They got involved um, and understood that like this girl is a saint and we have to help the world see her for who she is because she's a gift to the church. Any reflections on this prayer or anything on there? It's going to be such a beautiful reflection of her life, her personal life. You know, the hearty exile from her when her mother died, for instance, you know. It was almost like she was looking in the mirror of her life and she wrote that. <laughs> I think it reflects the fact that she was this unnoticed person. And I think it says you don't have to be noticed to receive the blessings that are afforded to you through your faith. I think her humility comes through here, and humility is very important. Do we have very many young things? Now I know the most recent one is Carla. Yeah. Her, and he was 17, correct? Yeah, approximately. Or give or take a year, yeah. 17 and 24. Yeah. Now. Yeah, there was a lot of saints who were like of the, um, there's musicians that are part of the 24 club who passed away at 24. There are also saints who are in the 24 club who passed away at 24. Um, Blessed Imelda, I think, is like 10. Um, oh, wow. She had this relationship with the Lord and the Holy Communion that is profound um, and amazing. Like, she wanted to receive communion, but was too young. So, and the Lord knew her heart. And what ended up happening is she, she was in prayer um, in her pew when her family went up to receive. And after everybody received, you know, the father put the put the host back in the tabernacle. Well, the host came flying out of the tabernacle and came directly to her. Oh. Oh. And then she received and she died of happiness. Is that in line? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was like 10. I don't know what year this was. I forget what year it was. Uh, was this? Blessed Imelda. Yeah, I believe so. That's, yeah. There's another story of a... Um, early church saint, St. Tarsisius, who was a child, who, um, another Eucharist-related one, he was sent by, at the time of the early church work, when he was alive, um, it was still, like, crime to, like, be Christian. And there weren't churches from all, all over, so he had to travel, and he was sent by the de by the deacon, by the bishop of his town to to give um he was like a ex extraordinary minister of Holy Communion in a way. The the bishop gave him communion and said, like, keep this. He like wrapped communion in like a corporal and said, keep this and deliver this to this deacon. Well, on the way, Tarsisius got martyred and he he wouldn't like let go. He wouldn't let go of the hosts. Because the, these guards were like, what are you holding? He was like, I'm not going to show you. Like, this is treasure. And, and later when he died, the deacon found him and brought him to, back to the bishop. 
and the Eucharist was embedded into his chest. That Saint Tarsicius, again, like a child at the time, early church saint. Um, there are many, many other saints. There's not many who are like under the age of 18. I know Blessed Imelda and Tarsicius are two of them. There are many saints um, who are like in their 20s or so. Um, there's probably many more that I'm forgetting at the moment. Um, but yeah, they, they exist, they're around. And I think there's something that these young saints can teach us but having a childlike heart. Yeah. You know, yeah. to me, what you're saying, it just points out the fact how eager uh, Jesus is to be with us. And you know, he's just so eager. You know, we're, we're receiving that, you know, when you, when you bring your love to him and you decide to be with him. He's so immensely anxious. He'll do anything to, to be with us. And that's yeah. what your stories prove to me, at least. Yeah. Any other questions or maybe questions about Therese and her relationship with our lady? Is that particular statue um, available? You know, like at Lourdes? Um, I'm, I'm talking about her at Cleveland. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's just like, it's like a normal, it was a normal Marian statue. Um, I think what made it special is like, I mean, the smile. Yeah. But there, there could be like replicas. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Probably. Uh, yeah, not that I know of. Yeah. Any other things about Therese? Question about Therese. One thing I love about her story too is that her parents are saints. There's not many married couples who are saints. <laughs> like together? Like together. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and take that as inspiration uh you say um but they were canonized together which is really cool and they were canonized in 2015 which is like reasons which uh, means i have to have proof that they that yeah. miracles same are thing. attributed to them yeah. i was going to ask that's very yeah. same. same thing yeah which is um from that was the 1870s 1800s so they kept all those records and even now I don't know how recent those miracles are that are, have, have been attributed to them. Um, some cases they could be back from then. They could be. They could be now. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think having having that witness and that example of a canonized married couple, not just saints who are married, that happened like one of them is canonized and like having a married couple as canonized saints is very mm -hmm. very uh, inspiring. So. Yeah. Yeah. When did your parents become saints? 2015. I'm sorry. 2015. Yeah. Well, Francis. Briefly, what did they do? I mean, is there something briefly that the children, you know, that they got to the saints or like patronages of? I would say like holy family, like in Brit, like living the holy family, yeah. and like having and living out the domestic church very well, um, knowing their. Um, professions they like louis could be patrons and watchmakers if there are, isn't already one and zelly could be uh patron saint of like lace makers if there isn't already one but definitely them as together as a unit that example of like the domestic church and spreading their faith to their kids um i mean three of their five surviving children are sisters so and one of them is a saint so they did a pretty good job uh, by the grace of God. So, yeah. yeah. I was just wondering, you know, how Jesus appears, Mary appears in vision and all to people. Did St. Joseph? Yeah, there are accounts of St. Joseph appearing. Um, I know he appeared alongside Our Lady at Fatima. Uh, 
Yeah. And I, yeah, there were probably other instances of Marian apparitions where he also appeared. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I know he appeared at Fatima. I just recently read that, so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Would you ever give a talk on St. Joseph? Oh, yeah. Would you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, if that's something you guys want, happy to do that. How did you decide which saints to focus on in this series? That's a good question. So, taking them in a chronological order, and both saints who are not well known, and some saints who are popular, so like John Biani, big, big saint, Therese, big saint, John Paul II is next week, big saint, but some like uncovering something new about them that we might like, like her relationship with Mary that we might not necessarily know about. Um, yeah, so saints who stand out, who are um, doctors of the church that we can learn more from. Yeah. So when you were saying that, um, like the saint of uh, the sisters in the convent didn't really realize that she was a little saint. Yeah. But listen, it was like taking down all these prayers and all her writings, like, couldn't you see that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She probably had, like, some friends beside her biological oh, sisters in the okay. convent, but many of the older ones just overlooked her. Yeah, okay. I don't know. There was something about Therese that must have had them be like, yeah, let's dictate some stuff. Let's, like, write down some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if that was common practice for the sisters. I don't know if okay. it was or not. Okay. But um, something about Therese. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, Sound of Music. Something about, isn't it something about Marie? Yeah. Gonna, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Something about Therese. Yeah. Yeah. Was there ever a movie made about her? About St. Therese? Yeah. Yeah. I forget what year it was. I have, I have seen it. I've seen clips of it. Sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think I remember something. I remember yeah. How her doing like these chores. Yeah. And it's in color. She did very hardly. Yeah. And then the 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 one that was really mean after she died, she realized, mm -hmm. you know, that she was mm -hmm. the same thing and she was the same. But like, it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. She managed to be now because she remembered her being so mean. Yeah. Man, I would mean the same. Yeah. That's <laughs> So Tuesday it was the feast of Saint Joseph. Father Vitali is supposed to come here. Say what? Um, and say a few words about Saint Joseph. Oh, like after mass? Um, yes. Cool. Oh. Nice. Yeah, his patron. Yeah, cool. sweet. So we're gonna say the rosary. In the church, and then come back here. And Father Rachel is supposed to come like back and talk about St. Joseph. Cool. Yeah. Uh, any other questions before we close? Reflections or anything? Cool. All right. So, announcement about next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about John Paul II. Uh, and his relationship with Mary um, and what he can help us learn about Mary to dive into life a little more as we enter Passion Tide. Um, there is a speaker coming next week. Her name is Erin Nugent. She is an associate of the nonprofit Theology of the Body Cleveland, which is dedicated to um, spreading John Paul's um, wisdom and his teachings um, and his relationship with Mary around the diocese. They do a phenomenal job. Um, yeah, and I will I'll give you a come to that for next week. You know, it's as, an, as an aside, there's a book out called The Pope and the President, which is about John Paul and his relationship with President Reagan mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the ending of the Cold War and the Iron Age. Mm -hmm. That might be interesting. It's yeah. an interesting parallel of personalities. Yeah, so I hope you can come next week. Let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, and why don't we ask for our ladies' intercession by praying this prayer up on the board since it's already up, right? Mm -hmm.
virgin full of grace. I know that at Nazareth you live modestly, without questioning that you turn me on. Neither ecstasies nor miracles, nor other extraordinary deeds. And hence the life of the queen of the elect. The number of the lowly, the little of us, is very, very big. And they can raise their mouths to you without any fear. You like the incomparable mother who walks the depth of our common way, God that we can have. The love of the mother in this heart and this heart. The lots of it always be you and follow you every day. I am the rapture by the contemplation of God. And I suffer in the depths of the love of the dear heart. All my tears vanish on the very heart of their faces. Which teaches you me to weep and to fill your sweats. St. Therese. Praise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.